All right, welcome to a Fort Knox update. And I'm calling it that, even though I haven't spoken to Clay before, Brett and I have done the hour-long one-on-one. Welcome to a Fort Knox update. Brett Taylor, Clay Bevor here. Um, it's coming, the startup is coming out of stealth. Uh, Brett, you and I talked about this some months ago. I don't even remember how long ago before you uh, were chairing the board of OpenAI. Uh, before some other things happened, you told me you were working on an AI startup, and here it is. So, Clay, nice to meet you guys. Tell me about Sierra. What is it? And uh, how did you raise $110 million for it? Well, John, it's so great to reconnect. Um, Sierra, we're creating the conversational AI platform for businesses. Um, our thesis is really simple. Uh, we think that conversational AI is perhaps the most important consumer technology trend in a generation. And now, if you're a consumer brand, the most frictionless experience isn't installing an app, it's not clicking a link, it's just having a conversation. And every brand is gonna to need to make their own conversational AI, and that's what we're trying to do at, at Sierra, is to enable every company to create their own AI. We've had just an incredibly fun time in stealth mode, as you said, we've been partnering with incredible brands like Weight Watchers and Sonos and Olakai uh, to create their own AI, and now we're excited to bring this technology to the world. So, Clay, give me an example of how a, a company like Sonos would be able to use its own conversational AI in a way that makes sense, especially because, you know, I've got a Sonos at home, have for years. It's linking up to multiple streaming services, maybe, you know, Spotify, Amazon Prime, Apple Music, et cetera. If you're looking for a song, building a playlist, you've got to deal with those services. So how does having conversation with Sonos help the experience um, you know, AI driven with all those different services. Sure, first of all, John, thanks, thanks for having us and I'm so glad to be here. We have built Sierra to enable our customers to create customer facing AIs that can handle a wide variety of tasks. And so, for instance, with uh, Sonos, we're working with them to create a conversational experience for device setup and troubleshooting so that if a listener is trying to configure new speakers, add a device to their system, they can just have a conversation and ask questions just as they would uh, to a person. And our other de design partners and early customers like Weight Watchers are using their virtual agents to support customers in a wide variety of tasks from changing subscription plans to getting advice on points and meals and more with great su success early on. So um, about, about the raise and about the vision, you guys met at Google and um, as Brett, you and I have discussed, your rise through Google coincided with the rise at first of Web 2.0, which for those who aren't familiar, the Gmail experience was revolutionary because the user interface was a lot more flexible than you could get on other browser-based mail clients. Google Maps blew people's minds because before was MapQuest and it was very static and here it was flexible and you could zoom and you could layer in you know, different experiences. Is AI, I know it does more than this, but does it change the user experience in a way that's parallel to the way Web 2.0 and those, um, you know, in a lot of cases, Java and JavaScript based uh, approaches revolutionize the web experience? Uh, John, it's a great question. And I would argue it's actually even more significant than Web 2.0. We think that the impact of conversational AI on consumer experiences will be on par with the internet. You know, fundamentally, in 1995, you needed a website if you wanted your business to exist digitally. Maybe in 2005, you needed a profile page. Maybe in 2015, you needed a mobile app. Well, now every company in the world needs an AI agent because your customers just want to have a conversation with you. And what's so interesting, if you saw, you know, ChatGPT was the fastest consumer service in history to get to 100 million consumers. It's because we're building on all of these previous technology trends. And we think that the adoption of conversational AI will dwarf them all. But the challenge for businesses is, is it's really, really hard. You shouldn't have to have a PhD in artificial intelligence to make your business succeed in this new world of conversational AI. And that's why we created our, our company. We want to enable every business, whether you're a consumer brand that has a lot of technologists on your firm or a consumer brand with none, we want you to enable your business to succeed in this new world of conversational AI. And uh, Clay, I, I know what Brett has been working on since he left Google. We've talked about that, uh, you know, the startups and, and Salesforce, et cetera. 
uh, you were working with Google Labs. Uh, tell me about the experiences that you continue to have there and why you decided to work on this. Yeah, first of all, I'm so grateful for my experience at Google. It's an incredible company. And what Brad and I saw with recent advances in AI was really a sea change in technology that we think will enable some fundamentally new and better experiences. And when there is a sea change in technology like that, it affords new opportunities for younger companies in particular to explore the space, to take some risks, and that was very compelling. And then there was also just the element of building a company with a friend of mine, Brett and I have known each other for almost 20 years, that was quite special. And so that is what uh, the opportunity I went to. John, in fact, my wife interviewed Clay at Google if you want some dirt on him. Wow, um, I, I don't even know where to go with that. There's a good you know, quip or joke in there somewhere, but uh, I don't know, I'll get back to me on that. So but <laughs> I, I wanna, I wanna uh, Brett, go back with you to joining the board of OpenAI because that happened after a, a moment that was, some have argued disruptive and maybe even transformational for the AI space and the AI conversation. I'm talking about back in November when Sam Altman was pushed out of OpenAI by the previous board and then brought back and the board reconstituted, I believe the first major change to the board that was announced was that you would be joining. Um, in that uh, series of days, weeks after the initial disruption, I remember having Connie Loizos, the editor of TechCrunch, on with me on CNBC, and she described that as an SVB, Silicon Valley bank level moment for the AI uh, ecosystem because people sort of realized we can't have all of our eggs in just one AI model basket, even though AI, you know, open AI and chat GPT were getting so much attention. Um, how did you think about that moment from the Sierra perspective and how, uh, what are you building on top of model wise, philosophically as you build Sierra, maybe based on that? Well, I'll start with just the personal, you know, I like so many others in the technology space was just really worried about OpenAI that weekend. You know, Clay and I left our jobs to work in this space because we're so passionate about the potential of this technology. And you have this incredible mission-driven nonprofit and it felt for a moment uh, like it might not exist. So, you know, I chose to, to take on the role of chairman in large part just out of a sense of OpenAI's mission being so important for the world. Um, and at Sierra, you know, we're, uh, we're building a solution for businesses. So we actually build on a, a variety of different models. Um, and in fact, if you chat with the Olakai agent to uh, you know, exchange your shoes, uh, there's probably four or five different AI models that are invoked to decide what to do at that point. Um, so like so many others, we're a part of this ecosystem. And what I would say is it's pretty amazing to see the innovation and what Reid Hoffman would call these frontier models, these models that require incredible amounts of capital expenditure, probably the best researchers in the world. And I think Sierra is a benefactor of all that research and development. And as I said, when I think about it from Sierra's perspective is, you know, I, I really think of frontier models as pieces of infrastructure that are becoming fundamental to software. We're really trying to package up a solution so that businesses can actually solve real world problems with that infrastructure without being experts in the field. Okay, and Clay, um, another piece of infrastructure that's very important to the AI ecosystem is accelerators, the chips involved. And right now, as reflected in the stock price of NVIDIA, the stock rise of Supermicro and others, there are fewer <laughs> accelerators, there's less hardware available uh, to fuel this than people would like. How does that influence what you need to, to raise money to spend it on in order to build uh, Sierra? And where do you see that heading? It's certainly something that we think about. We're somewhat insulated from it, however, by the fact that we use these frontier models built by the likes of OpenAI and others to run the core pieces of our infrastructure. And so we're able to scale through them. And also, as Brett said, our architecture is built in such a way that we can be flexible across which models we use and use a number of them. And so I would say we're one step removed from it, but it is always uh, on our mind. So you're a step removed from it. 
Are your customers as removed from it for the same reasons? Well, John, it's it's a great question, and I think if you look at you know just the build out uh, in semiconductors, you mentioned Nvidia as a supplier, the build out in all the infrastructure as a service platforms to provide this technology. No one's completely insulated from it. There's definitely a shortage in the comp computation required for both the training and inference in these AI models. Um, at the end of the day, though, be, we've really chosen an architecture that really tries to maintain as much flexibility as possible so that we can insulate our customers from the day-to-day -day disruptions that this infrastructure shortage represents. Okay, and finally, what's next? You're announcing this $110 million raise. Um, to what degree, uh, actually, let me not say finally, because I, I asked you about this before we actually started rolling. And I, I asked about the structure of the company you guys are sitting in CNBC San Francisco Bureau, but it's 2024, uh, commercial real estate is expensive. I was wondering, is the company based in San Francisco? Is it based anywhere? And you said, actually, you're an in-person company based in San Francisco. John, we, we are proudly based in San Francisco and we are an opinionatedly in-person company. Brett and I felt from the earliest days of the company, building a new company, a culture and everything that comes with that, that it was really important to be together in person. And so we are, uh, our, our employees love it. Uh, we in fact have lunch together every day as a team. It's one of the things that I think we both really look forward to in a given day. And so we're very much in person. Um, either one of you, tell me more about that. Um, some people would believe that technologies like those that Google has given us, that Salesforce has given us, that artificial intelligence gives us, that they drive down the need for as much in-person human interaction because we can get information in different ways. We can have conversations across you know, thousands of miles the way that we are now. What is it about building a startup at the stage where you are where you have that strong feeling? Well, John, I think there's really a difference between science and engineering. You know, and sometimes when you're building software, you know how to do it. And uh, as an old boss used to call it, it's a simple matter of programming. You just need to get it done. What we're in with AI right now is true science. You know, we're building new capabilities that really fundamentally didn't exist before. Uh, we have a lot of researchers on our staff. We have an old Princeton professor who's leading our research team right now. And we're really inventing new ways for companies to interact with their customers and how AI agents are built is a fundamentally new concept and new technology. And you know, it's not one of those things that we felt you, know, you could do just over Slack. We really felt like that congregation around the proverbial water cooler, the whiteboard, the lunch table uh, is really necessary when you're doing pure invention. Um, and it's also why Clay and I started a startup. You know, if you look at the history of technology, a lot of new companies are born in these technology waves. And it's not because incumbents don't have advantages, it's just in these moments where the technology is so new, uh, the value of agility, the value of having these unique customer insights starts to benefit startups a bit more. Um, so it's a fun time to be a startup and it's a fun time to be in person. All right, and finally, now actually, finally, what's next? stage wise, now that you've raised this funding, is it going to go mostly toward hiring more of those humans who are going to gather for lunch there in San Francisco? Is it going to go into infrastructure, which you've just said, you you know, because of the way the company is structured, you don't necessarily have to overspend on what's the next few months hold strategically? Well, John, if we're here with you a year from now, uh, we'd like to not just be telling the stories of Sonos and Weight Watchers and Sirius XM and Olakai, We'd like to tell you that we went to every major consumer brand in the world and we helped them build their own AI agent and help them succeed in this new world of conversational AI. So when we look at that money, it's really a means to an end of really driving more success for our customers. Um, and as you know, AI is one of those areas where it's easy to make a demo and hard to succeed in practice. We're really proud of the success we've driven with our customers to date. And I hope we're here with you a year from now, uh, sitting side by side with some amazing brands uh, and really driving